And I just wanted to thank Carol and Dave Lovelace and many others, I'm sure, that have been involved in getting this together and inviting me out here. I've always enjoyed coming out to Dallas, Fort Worth, even though it is 100 degrees outside. <coughs> and um, I hope I will make this uh, afternoon worthwhile uh, for you having come down here. <coughs> uh, my own journey uh, for this began 20 years ago. I can't believe it. It's uh, been 20 years since I saw my first case of what would ultimately be known as chronic fatigue syndrome in the Lake Tahoe region uh, in 19, uh, goodness, 85. <coughs> and I had only arrived there 18 months earlier when I saw my first case, which rapidly became several hundred and launched uh, essentially uh, my, my, at least my professional life and career as I spent the last 20 years trying to understand this uh, amazingly interesting and complicated illness. <coughs> I always thought to myself at times that if you could understand this disease, or at least even the process you would have to go through to understand it, uh, could be so well applied to so many other illnesses. And I think that remains true to this day. This is a very complicated illness. Um, it's a truly holistic illness. It involves virtually every organ system, and everything is mutually interactive. <coughs> and so it's complex. You can come at it from many different angles. And I'm sure you've known yourself from all the all the things you've read about it, how everybody has a view of this illness. It, they, everybody has a view because it is a truly holistic disorder. There are all kinds of things going on. Uh, since my background was in physics <coughs> long ago, as a physicist, I kind of approached complicated things by looking at the, the one or maybe two things or the, the principles by which everything is organized. As I, that's the way my brain thinks. That's how I was trained. Um, and so you may see that come through at times. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, the truth, I'm sure, is larger than anything that I will say here today, is larger than anything any of us know, and it may remain that way for some time, maybe even forever. Who knows what the true truth of this is? <clears throat> Nevertheless, um, the universe is somewhat like that, and physicists, especially astrophysicists, are always thinking about, I mean, how do we figure out this incredibly complicated thing, the universe? and maybe we'll never make it, but you know what? There are principles, there are things that occur, even in very complicated disorders, that are worth um, looking at, particularly when it comes down to trying to figure out what to do to help people. And um, I think uh, an amazing discovery was made not too long ago, maybe a couple years ago, <coughs> by uh, Peckerman and, um, and Nadelson, published in a um, medical uh, journal out of New Jersey Medical School. And they were the first ones, um, and I give them credit for this, to recognize that there was something going on in the heart and the hearts of chronic fatigue syndrome that was really quite extraordinary and may be impo is particularly important in their, in their article was not only the fact that there is a disorder of cardiac output, but more importantly, that the disordered cardiac output tends to predict dysfunction, or it does predict dysfunction. That is, the higher the output, the less dysfunction, and the lower the output, the greater dysfunction. This correlation of a physiological variable, um, which is qu correlates quite well, uh, is the first thing I've ever seen in the published medical literature uh, that really does correlate, at least a physiological parameter regarding a single organ system that, that's, so, uh, that's so predicted the function and dysfunction of this disease. <clears throat> there are lots of uh, physiological abnormalities in this disease. The immune system is disordered. The brain is disordered. Everything you tend to look at is in some way disordered. But no physiological variable that you could measure ever seemed to predict the dysfunctionality that we're seeing. Uh, along those lines, <clears throat> a group um, headed by Phil Peterson, uh, professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota, uh, in looking at the dysfunctionality apparent in any chronic illness that you cared to look at, all the way from AIDS to cancer to lupus to rheumatoid arthritis to chronic fatigue syndrome to cardiomyopathy and other things, <coughs> uh, had basically these groups of patients fill out uh, uh, validated clinical questionnaires to determine how dysfunctional they were. And they were struck by the fact that the most dysfunctional people in this, in, in, in when trying to get at the functionality of people. That's not the symptoms that they're expressing, but what they can do or what they cannot do. The most dysfunctional person or groups of people other than chronic fatigue syndrome were the cardiomyopathics. They were about even. 
In other words, uh, <coughs> cardiomyopathy and chronic fatigue syndrome have very equivalent dysfunctionality. And I thought that was kind of interesting, those two kind of set there together. Things that really, <coughs> in our mind's eye, don't seem at all alike. And having suffered the disorder of uh, cardiomyopathy myself, I certainly could see the difference between my situation and the situation of my patients, that's to be sure. Nevertheless, I also saw increasingly, having experienced this disorder, what my patients were exactly uh, feeling, especially from a functional point of view. Um, <clears throat> one of the important things I hope you get out of this, because I'm going to say it early, and I'm going to say it often, is that you do not have the typical type of cardiomyopathy that is discussed by physicians or in the medical literature. You don't have that kind. Uh, you have, <coughs> well, the kind they're referring to is called systolic dysfunction cardiomyopathy. The pumping chamber, the left ventricle, is not pumping properly. It's not squeezing hard enough. It doesn't give out enough output. It has a low ejection fraction, which is the, uh, uh, basically a number derived from the amount of blood that is pumped out divided by the amount of blood that it's filled with. Normal ejection fraction is about 60% or so. <coughs> Chronic fatigue syndrome patients are not only normal in this result, they're even slightly above normal as a group, which is kind of interesting uh, and even turns out to be relevant to this discussion. They are normal and even somewhat supernormal with regard to the squeezing of the left ventricle. The wall motion is normal. There's no there's no dyskinetic motion, there's no hypokinesis, there's no dilatation, there's no hypertrophy. It is a completely normal ventricle. On the basis of that, most cardiologists looking at this, on a viewing an echocardiogram that shows normal left ventricular function, normal ejection fraction, even better than normal ejection fraction, would conclude properly that you don't have a heart problem. At least you don't have a systolic heart problem. And that's a fact. <coughs> but that's not what you have. What CFIDS patients have is a diastolic dysfunction, which is a disorder of cardiac left ventricular filling. It doesn't fill properly. And a pump is a pump is a pump. And a pump is only as good as what it's filled with. If you don't fill it, then no matter how good it is, it can't pump out what it doesn't have to pump. So you have to fill well in order to experience good output, assuming you have normal left ventricular function, which you do. So the problem is one of filling. There's a filling disorder. We call that diastolic filling dysfunction. The terminology the cardiologist will use is called diastolic dysfunction. <coughs> Some people think it is as common, according to a study at the Mayo Clinic, as 20% of the population dragged off the street <coughs> who maybe have some symptoms perhaps but not significant symptoms and ask if they have heart disease and they say no as many as 20 percent may have some level of mild diastolic dysfunction however <coughs> that is sometimes determined by how you call it the parameters that are being measured can be different in different sites different in different uh, universities have different, uh, in different machines, uh, they can look at these uh, parameters and they can set the, the goalposts where they want. Set the goalposts, certain, uh, a large percentage of people might have this as much as one in five. Uh, set the goalposts a little differently, that number can drop considerably. So this is not <coughs> exactly a, uh, a very uncommon condition, diastolic dysfunction. But <coughs> if the diastolic dysfunction is significant enough along with other issues, to impair cardiac output, then there can be significant trouble, functionally and symptomatically. And that's what I'm here, that's the message I have to bring. I'll try to make it this again and again. You do not have the normal type of congestive heart failure. You do not have the normal type of systolic dysfunction. Uh, your left ventricle is fine. Indeed, the architecture of the hearts of chronic fatigue syndrome patients are basically intact. They have no significant architectural aberration. Therefore, from an architectural standpoint, the heart looks normal. It squeezes quite well. The left ventricle looks good. 
but it doesn't fill, and that doesn't show up very well on echocardiography. Indeed, the concept of diastolic dysfunction as a, as a concept is about nine years old. It was basically discovered in the, in the mid-1990s <coughs> by a professor of cardiology at the University of Kentucky. They began to observe that there was, a, that there was something unusual about the waveform pattern during diastolic filling in a group of his patients. And he didn't understand it, wasn't in the literature, wasn't written about, no one knew what it was. Indeed, the echocardiography of the, t of the times really wasn't suited for this type of measurement. The, f the frame rate speed and the lack of digitization uh, was difficult in terms of the analyzing this peculiar and aberrant waveform pattern. <coughs> 